Thank you, Steve. Art, the, the first question is, why did you write the book? <laughs> I, I think for two reasons. When I left Albany State, my job had been to consolidate, provide leadership for the consolidation of two campuses, <clears throat> one historically black and one historically white. And it was envir an environment where no one wanted to do anything, wanted a part of that. Uh, they were all uh, opposed. And it br I was exhausted, not emotionally and physically exhausted. I was exhausted with the notion that the unreconciled issue of race in America was so alive and well in a community. And I was struck by how people felt on both sides, talking with me about their passions, their anger, their angst, and their emotions, and their feelings about not wanting to be part of anything that suggested we could be educated together. And so when I retired, I had time to think about that. And I chose an approach as I tried to process all this information. I reflected on James Baldwin. James Baldwin went to Paris in 1948. He went there because many American artists, African Americans in the 20s and 30s, blues singers, writers, artists, and others went to get away from the United States. And I had spent four years in East Asia, and so I understood, understood what Baldwin was talking about, and I'll describe what, what he said. He went to Istanbul and 13 years later, and he finished another country in the fire next time. In his later years, he had a place in southern France where people like Sidney Poitier, Harry Belafonte, and Ray Charles would visit him while he was doing his writing. My time as a civilian was in Bangkok, Thailand for two years. I was a DOD civilian, and I had another two years in Taiwan in the military. So I spent four years in Asia. I had time to think about this country when I was out of it. There was nothing like being away from this nation to reflect, to analyze, and synthesize. The second thing that happened is I was free to move around freely in Taiwan, places like Taipei, Tainan, and Kaohsiung, when I couldn't move around freely in Selma, Montgomery, and Birmingham. Uh, there were signs all over the place, white and colored, when I was growing up. To give you one example, many people don't understand Jim Crow, but my mother used to go to Selma once a, a year to, for shopping. She was like most women in our community. They were excellent seamstress. But you couldn't, they didn't allow African Americans to try on clothes. You could hold them up in front of you, but you couldn't try them on. And that's part of the racial caste system of purity and pollution. If you touch anything, if African American pollutes it separate water fountains. So when I got to Taiwan, I could walk around, go into bookstores, go into restaurants, go into hotels, and to move around freely. So Baldwin talked about that. So when I got a chance to get away from and retire from the position at Albany State, I had a sensation like I had those four years in Asia. <clears throat> I had time to, ref to think and to reflect. And so I felt a need to explain myself to try, sort of write about this stuff. And I first took a stab at writing about this to consolidation. And the editor that worked with the University of Georgia Press said, Dr. Dunning, you sound a little circumspect. You're not an administrator anymore. Just say what's on your mind. And so I just cut loose. <laughs> so I said exactly what was on my mind. I wasn't trying to be cautious. But I had spent a lifetime in a profession where uh, I had used facts, data, reason, and logic, not emotion, anger, and resentment. So I was sort of talking about it, things in that way. So I wrote this book to give the reader a journey through the Jim Crow system and how in one of the poorest sections in a poor state uh, how I navigated through that. And the second thing is how to give the readers in this country 
a look at ourselves where we are now on the cusp of something that's, in my, these are my words, it's fairly dangerous. Uh, I think this, the problems we will solve, and I tried to talk about this in the book, they will lend themselves to generosity, restraint, and compassion, not to rage, anger, and resentment. If we're going to solve these problems, it's going to be generosity, compassion, and restraint. And usually, when things become uneasy for nations around the world and here, it's when there's sweeping economic uncertainty and sweeping social changes. For us, we have this huge demogra uh, dem demographic sea shift going on in our nation. We are a multiracial, multi-ethnic, and multi-religious nation. There's no way to get around that. We may wish to be something else, but this is what we are. And so how do we, how do we begin to now take what Jefferson and Adams said when they did not include slaves in the process and say that system of a democracy that has rule of law and orderly transfer of power can work for this present 2000 the 22 environment. So I wrote the book, Steve, to sort of reflect on all of that and to use my own life's journey and the Albany State Darden as a case study of how we act out our feelings and beliefs and emotions and thoughts about each other. And, uh, and just put that on paper. So that, that was this, and I, it was almost uh, a deep need to explain myself because and I'll say this and Stephen and I'll respond to another question. What was amusing to give you a sense of what was happening, as soon as this was announced by the system office, a guy I knew very well who was on the county commission, a white guy in Albany, called me and said, Dr. Dunning, I have some people who are tied up in knots about this announcement the chancellor has just made. Could you meet with us and spend some time in my law office to talk with eight or ten people and explain to this group what's going on? And when I walked in the room, I knew most of these folks, all my group, all men, said, there's well. So we started out. One man said, you need to understand, Dr. Donnie, none of us in here support, support this salvation. And by the way, Dr. Donnie, what in the hell is that HBCU? Uh, they are talking about consolidating Garden State with the HBCU called Albany State. Just what in the hell is that? And I said, well, this, let me, so I walked in the room, that the first one was changed the state in 1837, University of District of Columbia got started 1851 as a minor school of colored girls. And then 1854, I believe it was Lincoln University of Pennsylvania and Wilberforce. It was sick. All of those started before the Civil War, all right. And so I walked them through the land grant acts that created places like Auburn, Clemson, Mississippi State. But they excluded them, then they came later and created the Tuskegee and the AM and the Fort Valley State land grants. So we talked about that. He said, Well, you need to know white students in Albany are never going to go to a place that he calls. Uh, I said, We talked about that. What's, what's the job? So he talked about just the, what I call the state piece. I said, Peter Hart was a the leadership. So that was sort of the tone that was set by the group that has supported Darden State College over the years. So I get back on all the state's campus. I talked to a group of African American alums from all the state. Dr. Dunning, you better go fight for us to take our school. Well, you know, you know, I've been living in Auburn all my life. Those are crooks. Top to bottom. And Dr. Bunning, you need to carry the case. So I'm on both sides. Uh, this, that's not the sort of tongue. And I'll say one more thing, and then to give you a sort of feel for that. One Saturday morning, I walked out of the 
Harvest Valley. And in Albany, as the president of Albany State, there's no way you can go and be anonymous. Everybody can find someone to stop you and chat about something. So I walked out of this barbershop shop this guy said, Funny, I heard about this consolidation. He said, You know, 1994, we had a major flood. On one side, you've got those business folks downtown, white business people want to get the place closed, they're trying to close it down. So you need to be careful about that. On the other side, you got us to the money. At Albany State, they don't want to change anything. They want to stay like they are, they don't want to improve any processes, so you're going to catch hell from me. I said, that's interesting. Um, so that was sort of the political social context of what was on. And what I was trying to describe in the book, that we have not reconciled. Dr. King used this about 350 years. We had two, about 250 years of American slavery. 100 years of Jim Crow system. That's 350 years. We've only had since 50, this year will be 58 years after the Civil Rights Act. So you cannot discuss anything in this nation without discussing race. Can there's no way. So now here we are in a place where we are struggling with mythology versus science. What's the truth? I'll give one good example. I said this to a group recently. Thomas Jefferson wrote some of the most elegant language you've ever read in the Declaration of Independence and some of his later writings. But you can't discuss Jefferson not discussing Sally Hemings. You can't. And so you've got this issue where we are trying as a nation to come to grips with this American to them. The South Africans tried through reconciliation to say we cannot manage this mix in South Africa unless we sort of get this out of our system, which means tell the truth and reconcile. What we said after American slavery, good luck. Not, not even four days of news, so you on and on. And then shortly that, the greatest is a shot the system. The system is subjugation. That's how almost 100 years ago. 1964, many southern states said, this is Lyndon Johnson, you got his sign, Thomas, you signed the Civil Rights Act, now you enforce it. So what we have, and I'll say the truth of this is the last one, Steve. I, we have, in my life, we have had some demagogues so skilled taking these things that I'm talking about, causing us to really come apart at the scene. George Wallace was on the back of the flatbed truck <clears throat> when I was on my way to East Asia. My dad had dropped off a little tiny town, Thomasville, Alabama. Had my dog. And Wallace on the back of the flatbed truck, I think Patterson beat him first. Wallace said, let me tell you what, what I want you folks to do. These are all working class whites in the crowd from And he said, they're trying to change our life in Alabama. They're trying to change your life. And let me tell you who's trying to do it. He said, first of all, and I'm surprised, he said that lying scalawag of a federal judge named Frank Thompson. He's a good for nothing. He's a second, got hippies, communists, Jews, Yankees, and those liberal college professors. That's who they think they're better than you are. So what you have had in Huey Long in New Zealand, Ross Barnett in Mississippi, you had George Wallace here, Eugene Talmadge in Georgia, Strom Thurmond in South Carolina. You had some people who, who were good at Southern political theater in the demagogues. And so they, they caused people to just get it all in this, not be able to reconcile. So as I was thinking about this community, all of that came out through conversations. And I was surprised by how people would say almost anything was going on. They would tell me, black on white, and they were unabashed in South Georgia and all that. They were unabashed. 
So when I got a chance to retire, I thought, how are we, how are we going to do this? Because this was a case study, what we had seen in the process. This was a case study. I left with um, this. Oh, he's the solutions now. Steve, I'll stop. I would like you to talk briefly about something that's not in the book, and that is to relate a little bit about your experience as a student here at the university, <coughs> the interactions you had with uh, uh, your, your white students and black students as well, and then uh, how that led to trying out for the football team and working for uh, uh, President Matthews. Yeah. I got out of the military on Friday. Sunday I was in Baby Hall. So I went home to see my mom and dad in Franklin County Saturday and Sunday and then take the car. So I've been out of the military one full day. Um, and I walked over to the student center to the bookstore. The bookstore at that time was Reese Pfeiffer. Ferguson was a football field. Um, and so I went in to buy books for the class, and I was walking back from uh, the bookstore over in Reese Pfeiffer, and walking down the sidewalk in front of Bidgood and Morgan, and some student yelled out of Morgan, yelled a racial slur and said, go home. And it was, it was sort of a perverse amusement for me, because I'd been away in East Asia for a couple of years, and that racial slur let me truly know I was back at home. That, that was almost a welcome home, because in, in, in that period of time, that, that was so common, to, the use of that racial slur. But I was a veteran, I was 22 years old, had served my nation for four years and two years in, in a foreign country. The first class I went to in Tin Hoor, the ground floor, must have been 30 students in that class. This was in summer of 66. And I walked in the classroom, and about 10 students immediately got up and walked out, uh, just left. I don't, they never came back. And I was a junior before anybody sat by me in a class on, on campus. But that was around, first time I remember that happening was been here two years, I think 1968, where the seat, uh, beside me was filled more often, seat in the front, seat behind, any, and so I would just have a circle around me of empty seats. Uh, that happened uh, for the first two and a half, three years. And I walked on as in football, and I have to always tell my friends, in 1967, a big lineman was 240 pounds. Uh, and a running back about 180, 190, to explain why I was out there. Uh, now, uh, that would not be healthy. Uh, I, uh, and the reason we went out, one of the guys in my, across the hall, African American guy said, did you hear what one of the coaches said? And I said, what, what was it? He said, I was told that a coach said, an assistant coach, that he did not ever foresee a day when the University of Alabama to, could recruit any Negroes and that they would not have the capacity intellectually or physically to play football at the University of Alabama. And so <clears throat> he said, why don't we go out there and just say, hey coach, sign us up. And I'm, I'm 22 years old and my only feeling at the time is to create and normalize space everywhere not to play football at Alabama. But I went out and stayed out there for several days until I realized that this felt worse than basic training. <laughs> that, that I'd been there and done, I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, and we walked into the, behind the natatorium, I think on Thomas Field. Must have been 90 guys there. Kenny Stable, who played for the Oakland Raiders, was quarterback, a guy named Jackie Sherrill who coached at Mississippi State, Washington State, Pittsburgh, and Texas A&M, was a uh, graduate assistant. And no cable, just three stations, C I mean three networks, CBS, ABC, and NBC. That was before any cable. 
So we walk off the field and everybody had a mic. Why are you here? And uh, having gone through a process in Taiwan of shifting from feelings about things happening back here in 1963, like blowing up girls in a church, I had gone through the anger piece. I, th I just kind of said, you know, I've always wanted to play for Coach Bryant all my life. <laughs> and he was looking at me to say, I'm out here for a social cause. I'm out here to desegregate. I, I, had, I said none of that. So the purpose was to create space for persons of color everywhere, not just in boardrooms, but football fields. And it was, it was the normalization of it. It was the normalization for American citizens to be anywhere they had the capacity. And King talked, what King meant, said, content of our character. Jefferson said something similar. He called, we need a virtual, not a virtual, a, a, a natural aristocracy that has virtue and talent. We don't want monarchies, but what we need is a natural aristocracy that you are measured by your talent and your virtue. King said the content of our character. They were talking about the same thing. So we were, as young students, trying to figure out <clears throat> how we could do that for all areas. And one of the things we did, uh, we met with President Frank Rose, who was, uh, his office was in Carmichael, where the Dean of Education office is now. And the reason we met with him is that we saw a float, a homecoming float, and they had men, male students, wearing Confederate uniforms and female students wearing antebellum dresses. The thing that caught our attention, they had 12 and 13 year old African American young boys from Tuscaloosa fanning them. They were sitting, the women were sitting, and these African American uh, boys portrayed slave kids. So they were fanning these girls as the float went down University Boulevard. The homecoming parade. We went to see President Frank Rose and said, Dr. Rose, we, we just don't, all 10 of us, we just don't think that's a good idea. <clears throat> he had sort of a patrician bearing and uh, he said, well, I'll look into it. And we'll see what we can do about that. We didn't go back to see him, nor did he follow up with us, but we didn't see the float anymore. I think that was the end of it. So on this campus, uh, there wasn't by that time, there wasn't, Wallace had stood in the door in 63 in June. What was happening then was almost how some religious sects do when you offend them, they shun you. Is that it was shunning was almost like, you know, you, you, you are in our space and you are contaminating this space. And so that was kind of moving away from having National Guards here in 1963 because of worrying about violence. But I having lived in, having worked in East Asia and uh, been abroad and gone to places like the Philippines, Taiwan, and other places, I felt right at home. I, I told, I say one more thing, Steve, and I'll finish. When I left, to go abroad, I felt no ownership about anything in this state and in this country except our family land in Sweetwater, Alabama. But when I came back, I felt like I was a participant in the nation. I was an owner as a, because that served the nation abroad. I felt fully empowered, fully engaged, and fully a part of this culture. And I was done with being controlled by my color. Didn't know how that was going to work out, but I was not going to obey Jim Crow laws. And luckily, that things changed shortly thereafter. But that transformation happened when I was gone. That's why I used the James Baldwin approach. I was able to reflect and think about a lot of things. And there were five or six things that happened in 63 when I was gone. And Mr. Gibbons being assassinated, Kelly Ingram Park in Birmingham. Wallace standing in the door, Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. And lastly, Kennedy was assassinated in November 63. All that happened when I was off the coast of China. And when I realized how deep the fault line was, I knew it was deep. 
But when Kennedy was assassinated, I was awakened by a Taiwanese young boy who we were paying to keep our barracks clean and do a lot of things around the barracks. He touched me on the shoulder and he said, the president has been shot. And I said, was he in Taipei? He said, no, 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 the American president. So I quickly got up. And there were two airmen, one was from Morrow, Georgia, and the other was from Huntsville, Alabama. They were screaming and yelling and clapping, saying, we got the SOB. We got the SOB. Kennedy, we got Kennedy. And I thought, what are they talking about? And what they were celebrating, Kennedy had given a speech after Wallace stood in the door here in, at Foster, supporting civil rights, supporting a civil rights bill. And they were anti-Kennedy for that very reason. And Lo and behold, uh, civil rights got passed the next year, stronger than what Kennedy proposed by Lyndon Johnson. But they were celebrating the death of an American president, and he was the commander in chief, and we were on foreign soil. So I went back, so when I sat down as a 19 year old, I sat down on my bunk and I thought, I only had 19 years to process this, but I realized this thing is real deep, that if you have two airmen we're in the uniform of our nation. We're on foreign soil and they're celebrating the killing of the American president because of his stance of trying to end a hundred years of a racial caste system called Jim Crow. And as plain as I can say it, that meant when my mother went to Selma, if my dad and I had to find somewhere to wait, he always had a newspaper and always had a book. We would go to the colored waiting room at the Greyhound bus station and sit and wait. Not traveling on a bus, but that's where you could sit and nobody would, you, you would not be bothered. You didn't want to sit on the street because they said, what your boys doing here? I mean, people just, the dig, lack of dignity. So Kennedy was trying to say, these laws make no sense in a, in a society like ours that talks about democracy. He was trying to end that. And when he was assassinated, that's why these two guys celebrated. Now that's over. But they didn't anticipate a guy from East Texas, named Lyndon Johnson, who was wise about the Senate and could twist arms of Southern senators to get this thing passed in 60, 64. I'd like you, if you could, a lot of my uh, white friends don't understand what my African American friends always call the talk or the conversation. Um, uh, I've yet to meet any black professional that hasn't had driving while black pull over at some point. Tell us about the conversation you had with your father when he didn't want you to come home, drive home at night from a regular camp. Yeah, I, I had a an interesting sort of pattern when I was here finishing final exams or finishing the weekend of classes. And Reverend Gardner, one of the things I always did was go to Stillman College and the Hay Center was brand new then. And so I would, uh, on Friday night, go by Stillman, three or four other students over here. Because what we always said, when we went over there, we saw smiling faces. And then after I'd stay there a couple of hours, I used to go to a place that my mother quite could never understand why in the world did I like blues music so much. And so I went to a place called the Citizens Club. And there were people in there like Joe Simon, uh, Little Milton, Bobby Bland, uh, all those blues singers that uh, play in those kinds of places. Uh, and so I would sometimes leave there about one or two o'clock in the morning, either go down Highway 69 through Greensboro or go down 43 to, through Utah and Demopolis. My mother was always a voracious reader, so she was up when she'd hear me coming in the house. And she and my dad, they always talked about things and my coming and going. And he would long since gone to bed, but he get, got up at four o'clock. Yeah all his life. Uh, and he called me one morning. He said, let's go for a walk. 
going for a walk, man, let's talk. And so we went for a walk down on our land where we, he, when I was a child, he kept cattle and grew timber. He said, when you are coming home, why don't you go to, go back to the campus and uh, let's go to bed and come at seven or eight o'clock in the morning. And I just asked him, why would he, and I'm, again, I'm a veteran and feeling empowered because I've not had restrictions on a far, in a foreign country. He said, it's dangerous. He said, if you come through Greensboro or you come through Democracy in Utah and there's a policeman sitting in a light and he sees a University of Alabama sticker park and decal on your car, he, he turns the light on to stop you and make sure that the car is not stolen because he does not know African Americans are yet up at Tuscaloosa. And you might say something to provoke him and you could lose your life. And he said, if something happens, guess who's worried they're going to take? It won't be yours, it'll be his. And you need to just not drive home that late at night. Go back to the campus and go to, and go to bed. And he was a high school principal. And I never grew tired of hanging out with him. We used to walk our land a lot. And I wanted to say to him, I've served the nation. I'm 22 years of age. I have felt free in a foreign country. I know what that feels like. I want to feel free back here, just to go and come and be left alone. But I did what he said, because in hindsight, he's right. And that was before, I mean, we even have a hard time now with cameras. You can imagine what would have happened in 63 had I got shots in Utah, Alabama, Democracy, Alabama. That's the end of that discussion. Um, so he was saying, I need, you, I need you to be protected. And what was so interesting to me in hindsight, I couldn't think about it then. then. I did not have the wherewithal to think about it. But all these years later, just the juxtaposition of walking around the streets of Taipei and Tainan and no restrictions and to come back home to my native country, I've got to start navigating in ways to protect myself. And having to listen to my dad, who knew at intimate knowledge about the Jim Crow system and the coming and goings of that. So that was that that was a the challenge of that. And you didn't you didn't look to the county courthouse for justice, did you? Say again? You did not look to the county courthouse for justice. No, we uh, I talk about this in the book, the self-regulation that many African-American communities did in my, my section of the state. Calling the sheriff was not a solution. Uh, calling the sheriff was an added set of problems. Nothing in that courthouse happened in London except demeaning uh, where 22-year-olds clerks behind the desk talking to a 75-year-old African woman, Mary, what you want this morning? Uh, so this whole idea of what I call the, the dehumanization of people, I, I saw it as a child and how elderly African Americans were spoken to by the 20-something group. So the courthouse was not a place of anything except necessity to pay taxes by a tag, but not to look for, not even close, respect and justice. And that was, that was sort of the norm. And one of the things I saw in Albany is how that had impacted people over the generations. I remember when I was in, in Taiwan when those girls were killed at 16th Street Baptist Church. That was the only thing, all these other things I mentioned had kind of caused me some heartburn, but this one tied me up in knots because I knew the nature and the importance of the black church in the South. In my rural community, the church was much more than a place of worship. And, and before that church was bombed, George Wallace said, according to the New York Times, what we need in Alabama to stop all of this foolishness about civil rights is a few more first-class funerals. 
Once we get that, that people in that. Two weeks later, somebody thought it's proper to put dynamite outside of the 16th Street Baptist Church. So I must have been so intense about it. I had a supervisor who was a native Hawaiian. And we were, I got off on midnight shift and turned weapons in. He said, let's go for a walk. So we were walking down the flight line, Taiwanese jets taking off, American planes taking off. He said, you tired of, you know, he said, you walking around like a lit fuse. And I kind of unloaded about what was happening back in the States in 63. He said, but you, you, you're not going to solve it just by uh, the intensity you have right now. You're one of the bright guys in my squadron. I need you to figure this out. And I wondered at times, was it his Polynesian background and things that had happened in that part of the world that he could understand? But he's, he, kind of, he sort of pulled me aside and said, you need to sort of relax and temper this. And, and so when I came home, I had, I had sort of lost sort of any, o any overt uh, feelings because I had been in an environment where I was treated with dignity, respect, and, and understood the complexity of what's going on won't be solved by rage, anger, and resentment. So I got deeply immersed in scholarship, deeply immersed in learning, deeply immersed in, uh, I always was a voracious reader, but I started to examine a lot of things. And I'll give you one good example. When I was here as a student, I took a lot of classes in Morgan, and I read things by Flannery O'Connor, uh, Faulkner, and Robert Penn Warren, in addition to Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison. So I was, I was trying to get all sides of an issue. So I was just digging deeply into scholarship. And one of the things I did not know about was the lost cause. That after the loss of the Civil, Civil War, that a lot of people reframed in the South what the Civil War was about. It was never about slavery. It was never about mistreating people. And what we had as part of the lost cause narrative, and I did not know this, that we had benevolent slave masters and happy and contented slaves. And that was all disrupted by this mob mobocracy group from the North, affecting a slave democracy in the South. And so I was beginning to try to look at these themes that are out there that so undergird who we are and how we think about things, the nature of things. And so when I came here as an undergraduate student in Alabama, I think I read as much outside of the class as I did in the class. Because I was just sort of intense about it, just learning, just having a deep, deep feeling about uh, knowing things. And so in Albany, I used to talk to so many people of all different sides that many, many didn't even know what Jim Crow was. I mean, they'd heard it, but they, couldn't, they, but they couldn't sort of put the pieces together. That's how far we had moved away from it. And it used to amuse me. He said, Dr. Dunn, you just don't understand this race stuff. I said, well, I think I do. And, uh, and are you sure you, you don't act like you're mad about things. You talk, you explain, you describe. And, um, uh, you need to, we think you, you need to get, get in there and mix it up. And I said, I mix it up with my mind. I talk, I explain, and I push, and I describe, and I tell. And I frame issues as us, not us and them. Because I'm part of this. I'm, I'm part of, this is my country, guys. Come on. So I'm, I'm putting myself squarely in the middle of this picture. And... Uh, but it was hard to do with polarization on all sides. And when people were playing out the historical ways that we processed information in our sex. And that's where I want to pivot. Uh, in your book, uh, I have one quick story. If, uh, when he was working in the president's office, Matthews took a call from Wallace. Wallace wanted a flag put in front of this building to fly the Confederate Stars of Mars. President Matthews was 
call out a cabinet meeting to me to take the call from the governor, and that was the subject while the legislature was in session. Matthews said, no, we will not, we fly the American flag, we fly the state flag, we're not going to fly the stars and bars. Lo and behold, the legislature appropriated the money to build the third flagpole. Matthews refused to take the money, and had he done so, we would have had all the debates in South Carolina, we would have right here. And a lot of people, the other thing that happened while he was working in the president's office, Matthews made a statement committing the university in 1970 when he took over to having a thousand African American students on campus by 1975. And once the president publicly went live on that, that gave permission for every department and division on the campus to do something about it. And I think there's a real lesson in history for our university today to look at that time when Art was working in the president's office. Now, Art, you arrive at Albany, and again, that's one of the very few committee communities where King's nonviolent strategies didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about seven strategies for reconciliation. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? I won't talk about all of them, Steve, but I will uh, pick, well, let me ask you to do this, highlight, highlight those for me, that you, do you have them in front of you? Do I have the what? Have them in front of you, I'll, if not, I'll. Got the book right there. Okay, let me, <clears throat> let me, uh, uh, <coughs> without making this too much as a, as a recipe, uh, one was a, that sticks in my mind that I used uh, as a strategy was a network of healthy relationships. Um, the thing that I noticed for the Darden State College people and the Albany State people in the community and within the campus was not a network of, of healthy relationships um, and building alliances. And I use almost ad nauseum that in order to deal with some of the problems we have, it's gonna take cooperation, collaboration, and leverage. That that's gonna be the sort of style that makes, a leadership style that makes things work. So that, that was one of the things that I highlighted. The other, is Japan had been closed to the West for decades, but they opened up. Admiral Perry pushed them to open, I guess, to trade. But what they realized when they opened up is how many things they learned and they adapted them to Japanese way of doing business. One of the healthy network of relationships I said is adapting strategies without humiliation. Tom Friedman talked about that. Is how do you, because we had challenges with recruitment, retention, and graduation. And one of the top universities in the nation with re recruitment, retention, graduation is all, I mean is uh, Georgia State University in Atlanta. So I sent, asked a delegation to go but I noticed on when I was asking people to pull together a team, I noticed some resistance on campus to going to Georgia State. And somebody said, Dr. Dunnett, we don't need to go anywhere to learn about recruitment, retention, and graduation from a white school. And I said, this is generic, it's not about an issue of race. I said, but they are graduating more African Americans than anybody in the university system in Atlanta. So they're doing something. And the reason I knew that, I had spoken with the chancellor, he mentioned predictive analytics, a process that Georgia State was using that was highly successful with African American students. And so I wanted this team to go up there. And what one person pulled me aside and told me why there was some resistance. And the resistance was, is going to a, quote, white school to learn about 
working with African American students. And this was what I call adapting, adapting policies and practices without humiliation, without worrying about where it comes from. That there are generic things across the world. Don't worry about the source, but if it's effective and efficient, don't tie the color and ethnicity and religion to a process. And, and so for, that was, those are the two strategies. The other one that I've thought about is thinking strategically and being data driven. Um, I, people, when I first got to Albany State, people would come to me with a case and the case was being made around passion, not data, facts, and information. And it was, the word had gotten around that the last thing that I would pay attention to is somebody coming in because it feels right to do this and it's, it's the cause. It has to be data driven. And when I, I wasn't thinking much about that because I'd had to function in an environment at the university system in Atlanta and UGA that I didn't start anything unless I sort of understood the reality of the circumstances. And finally, I, one day I was walking down the hall near the president's office at Albany State. I heard somebody say, if you're going to see Dr. Dunning, don't go in there just talking about what you think. You better have some information that shows here's where we are that is factual and it's reliable. And what and I finally explained that in a cabinet meeting that we're spending time, money, energy, and resources. And it cannot be because you're coming in making a case about something because you have an opinion about it. Um, and as I think about what, where we are now and Wallace's comment about the anti-intellectual are we in a post-truth society? Are we now in a, in a post-truth society where no one tells the truth, but also are we in a place where everybody's opinion is as valid as expertise? I use Steve as an example. He spent his career looking at higher education systems and, and structure and organizations and research on a number of things. But there are people who would discount that because I think this. So my opinion is just as valid as your expertise. That seems to be uh, what, what we are in a lot of cases. I watch sometimes school board meetings on television where people are saying, I don't want my child to hear anything about this subject, whether suppression or privilege or anything about race. And I'm th thinking how, how are we going to manage our affairs if we only want to deal with mythology and not fact? If we only want to deal with myth mythology and you are saying, my opinion is this versus the expertise and fact and reality over here. So what, one of the things I was trying to do at Albany State and, and and my mom and dad went to Alabama State, and my dad also went to Tuskegee, and my sister went to Alabama State. And they have a great deal of passion about the places because as I reflected on listening to them talk, in local parentis and how people, how they were nurtured in that environment, um, it was significant to them. But it can't be so significant that you don't now look at 21st century and modern practices and how technology and globalization, automation and climate change is affecting all of us. You can't run the 1930s Alabama state in this present environment we're in. We gotta just take care of our children. It's gotta be a more uh, complex administrative and leadership process than we have now. And so I was, all I was trying to do is to say, uh, I recognize the historical passion you have about this institution, but the world's going to run past us full speed if you're sitting here talking about just our HBCU heritage. If that's all you're talking about, and I get that, I understand that, 
And I'm saying you better think strategically and be nimble and agile and use data and use facts and information. And build relationships. If your relationships are toxic, and we had many, because people told me they were toxic. And I don't know why I wonder about my predecessors. Did they unload on them like they unloaded on me? People would tell me anything about their feelings about what was going on. So Steve, that's just three of them. I wanted to give the audience now a chance to shoot some questions, but I will say I was struck in the book by how Dr. Dunning brought data away from passion, and that the future of HBCUs and other regional universities was going to be based on the quality and high expectations and creating a culture of high expectations and not agreement and victimization. That's just not going to get our ox cart out of the ditch. And I think about the relevance of that a lot when I think about what can we do today as a university to maybe help flex out about that if you're Native area. Um, questions from the audience? Please. Yeah. Dr. Donner, thank you so much for your talk. I can't wait to read the book. Um, I just, I had the opportunity in the late 90s to go to South Africa and, and meet with Bishop Tutu. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, church group. Um, and he said to us, it was four years after apartheid had ended, and he said to us African Americans, uh, at least we're doing something around truth and reconciliation. You have never got your 40 acres in the view. Mm -hmm. So I wanted you to sort of comment on maybe a structure that would get us there, because you could sort of comment on it. I wish some of us would call it reparations, but some kind of structure that would get us over that gap that you mentioned. Okay. That's an interesting question because I, I never forget one night I was in a two person team and I was walking, and this was after the uh, killings in, of those girls in the church in Birmingham. So I was with a guy from Memphis, Tennessee, a white guy. We were walking through this nuclear weapons area and we were checking facilities. And he was saying something about what he had heard. And he said, what do you people want? And I said, <clears throat> I said at this point, all I'd like to have is just to be left alone. Just, just be left alone. And as I've reflected on that, here we are with labor. The, the labor of African Americans built the South's economy and by extension the nation's economy. So 250 years of labor from African Americans, another 100 years through the sharecropping system. So we had 350 years of that labor building our economy. And there are people in our midst. On the one hand, you have the former majority leader in the U.S. Senate says, we don't, we shouldn't pay anybody anything because we were not here 150 years ago. We have no obligation to do that. None of us had anything to do with that. And there are others who were saying, I watched my grandparents' land being taken from them. I watched them work from early morning to late evening. Somebody needs to say something about this. Whether it's accountability, how do you create circumstances where we balance the accounts? That we balance this. Because if you've got 350 years of labor, and now we've only had 58 years of an open system, and I grew up in an area where the area is still suffering from basic amenities, whether it's internet, whether it's the assertion and aggression about going to college and knowing how to navigate through systems where people sometimes are not uh, strong enough. And, and I, I, my wife and I had this discussion a couple of days ago. And I said, I, could I don't know whether it's military or my personnel, but I could navigate a system and I could figure out things. I said, in many ways, I was kind of a hard case. She said, you still are. <laughs> And I said, no, no, I'm a kind man. I'm a very kind man. Um, 
So we have students coming from these areas. Yes, ma'am, no, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, and just not pushing. So the aggression and assertion. And the other piece is that the amenities like internet, the, the books in schools, and the, all of those things that create what I can call economic, social, and political infrastructure that normalize high expectations. My area lacks that. And, and I had two folks, my mom and dad, who we couldn't go to the public library in London because it was not allowed. It was segregated. But they, they, the internet they used in 1960s and when I was in high school was called the U.S. Postal System. We had books, magazines, newspapers, encyclopedia. So it, I was able to visit the world. And so this whole idea of how do you settle, how you have an accounting, and, and one way you, when you use the term reparations, is causing people to get in our corners. You get in your corner, I get in my corner. We're gonna come out fighting, because I no one alive this. So how, what sort of language, how can we reframe, Pam, what we're talking about? How do you settle, have an accounting of that 350 years of building the economy of the South and by extension, the nation's economy? How do you settle that when you've had free labor? Um, and you're not part of the system. That's a question that unless we figure out, I mean, we can't even get anybody to say, I need to apologize for that. Formally, the legislative bodies around these 16 or 17 states, we need a formal apology for what went wrong. You can't even get that. So I'm, I, this is one of the, and I think that was Steve, the Albany experience that was, people were saying Dr. Dunning, you need to know the nature of where you are. This is what we are dealing with day in and day out. And I was not unaware of all that, but what I chose to do, and what this guy in, in Taiwan, a native Hawaiian was telling me, this system that you grew up in, it now got you hostage. It's got your brain. You're being held hostage because you can't think. And it shocked me because I was being held hostage. And I walked back, came out of that part of the world and back to this country, relaxed. Mm. Very much relaxed. So I could talk about this in Albany where it looked as if uh, I, was, I was not in a fight all the time because I had gotten relaxed by saying, this is my country, perhaps more than yours because I served it for 48 months. I didn't could put that exaggerated slant on it, but I served the nation. Gave four years of my life to this country on foreign, two years on foreign soil. So, if, unless we can reconcile either in, in fusion, and Steve talked about this just with the grant, I, I think there's a Marshall Plan almost. That, there are counties that starts in Southern Virginia, they go all the way from Southern Virginia all the way over to East Texas, and it cuts through South Georgia and South Alabama right through Sweetwater, Alabama. Uh, it's, it's the three census reviews. They're in the top two quartiles of poverty in this nation. That means they're staying there. And so it's going to take an investment, an intense investment, and Marshall Plan may be a bit too much, but that is the place where everything that you could turn upside down to get labor out of people and shut them out of every system you could think of, it happened in Marengo, Clark, Sumter, Wilcox, Green. It happened in all, those, all these counties throughout the black, it happened there. And how do you begin to have this discussion where you don't have people just with these shut down the discussion as soon as you open your, so, so language, how do you frame this in a way? Because I, I have a good friend who was head of diversity at the University of Georgia, and I used to tell her, I said, you, diversity is not your issue, it's the university issue. You need people supporting diversity. The dean's department, it's when your back is turned. When you're not in the room, they're discussing diversity as much as you are. So what you need to do is to figure out 
go see them one-on-one -on -one and explain to each of the deans how you can be, provide technical assistance, support, and framing of this. So when your back is turned, they're supporting your mission. But if you think you're gonna get on the president's cabinet and walk in and beat people into submission, I got news for you with that one. Because you come in with your, with your fist and, and you're, ready to, you're ready for battle. That was not an environment where that could even get off the table. So this whole idea, getting to the bottom of what Desmond Tutu talked about, you guys haven't done anything over there across the water in the United States of America. And you, all you guys, are still fighting about it. So that's, that's the piece that, that, I'm, that I struggle with. And I don't, if I had an easy answer, I would, I would say that. But for me, that I do know that has helped me throughout my career is the framing of the issue. It's framing it and using context and where people can begin to see it's an issue, not what I'm pointing at you and saying you at fault. That's not what I'm, I'm so that, that's going to be, and right now, I'm not sure we have many people who are skilled at doing that. Mm. Uh, I'll use one example, Steve, and I'll stop. I was sitting around the table at Michael Adams University, president, and we were discussing, I brought up the Latino initiative that I had started at the University of Georgia because the Latino population was exploding in Georgia, especially around Atlanta. And I said, you know, maybe we ought to look at it. In, ad in addition to recruiting African Americans, recruiting Latinos, and, and one person who was in the admissions office said, now, let's, let's make sure we keep worry about quality now. Uh, about, and I said, I said, well now, I, I was not talking about quality. I don't think diversity is a synonym for deficit. I said, I, that's not, I didn't think when we discussed diversity, that was a synonym for deficit. What we are talking about from these populations, we recruit students in these populations who can handle a high performing environment, regardless of the background. But what the interpretation that this person heard, that if you diversify, you're getting less than rather than more than. And I didn't look at it and say, what are you talking about? I mean, I know some, I have friends who would say that. Mm -hmm. are, you, are, you, are you trying to say this? And I said, no, that's, and she looked, at, she understood instantly what I, what I just said, that this is not a synonym for less than. And so this whole idea of language, and that seems to be what we're stuck with, is how to do framing of this, where you can keep open the discussion and get to the bottom of whether there's an apology and what is possible for 350 years of labor, what, what is it that this, this country has the capacity to do in places like the Black Belt? Dr. Dunn, thank you so much for this uh, very informative and inspiring talk. Um, there's a, a section in your book where you talk about a very uh, almost volatile student group who uh, showed a lot of resistance to the merger of Albany State and Dartmouth. And my question is one of how do we go about advocating uh, or being activists for the changes in which you just spoke of? You list in your talk today generosity, compassion, and restraint. There are some younger groups that perhaps may disagree with that. So when we survey history, you have SNCC. Uh, but then you have uh, another uh, group that is more practitioners of respectability politics and SCLC, NAACP. And I think that dynamic also exists today. And you have more radical and very passionate uh, groups like Black Lives Matter and young people who are, are really impatient and tired of the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. uh, but then you have your more traditional, uh, older perhaps groups that also won't change but feel that there's a different method. My question is how do we get these two groups to work together and what is a strategy to advocate for whether it's reparations, whether it's changes in the university or in our community? 
that's an interesting question because <clears throat> Dr. King, near the end of his life, if you look at his earlier life, he, he used the most sacred text in Western civilization, the Bible. And he talked about brotherhood and, and the content of our character. And so he always looked at us rather than us and them. And he was beginning to lose out near the end of his life because there were people who were saying, uh, I'm not turning the other cheek. This is too slow. I want to do it overnight. And he, Dr. King at times used to walk sometimes through African-American neighborhoods and maybe stop in at the pool hall and talk to guys. And somebody yelled, hey, Dr. King, I hear you got a march tomorrow. You need me down there to help you out? And he said, young man, I sure would like for you to do that. He said, I'll bring my gun if I, ne if I need to. He said, no, no, you stay out. You stay home. We don't need. And what you had was a, a leadership style and an understanding of civil disobedience and nonviolence. And Gandhi used it in India. He, he sent the British back home. They'd been there about 190 years. And, so civil disobedience and nonviolence, and, and uh, both countries were changed forever. So King's approach was no weapons, no violence, and just to disobey unjust laws. And we're not trying to change the system of government, we just like to be under it, just like everybody else. <clears throat> there were people who were 19 and 20 years of age and I felt it when I was talking to my dad. Uh, I don't plan to wait for these folks to adjust to my coming and going to be free to drive down this highway at one o'clock in the morning like any other person. So I was impatient. Uh, but my respect for him as a man uh, caused me to listen to that. But these were two schools of thought. One was saying, as a father, and as an older person, be patient, take your time. And I'm another saying, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna be patient about this. I'm gonna get in my car and drive like everybody else. And I'm free to move down these highways. So what, how do you create what I call campus dialogues, campus conversations or community conversations where people of an older generation is working with the people, you know, young people, to how to help them act out their feelings and emotions in ways where they grow and develop and not lose the passion, but guide the passion. Not, not lose it, because you're, not, you're never gonna cause young people to not have passion about issues and ideas, either for good or ill. They're gonna have that. <clears throat> so how do you begin to frame that in ways where uh, you can have these with this on a university campus, with campus conversations around complex issues. And I used to do that. I used to have peace a night with the president at Albany State. And, and I used to sit there and listen to 18 year olds and 19 year olds. I was thinking when I was their age, I was in a weapons area in Taiwan with a gun. And it scared me. I didn't want them to go to the grocery store by themselves. And, and so, but they would come up with some interesting stuff. Dr. Dunn, we don't have time for that. It was like, and I thought, okay, is it social media? Is it, uh, is it the immediate gratification? What is it? They, they think these complicated problems can just be solved overnight. Mm -hmm. And no human systems, they don't work that way. And I thought every one of them had a device, cell phone, they were just, just doing things. And uh, I said, how do you know that? Well, Dr. Dunn, I did my research. I said, you saw this on Facebook? I said, you saw this on Facebook. Yes, sir, it's, that's what somebody put out there. So I'm sitting here thinking, Mom, I started thinking about that Marvin Gaye song, Inner City Blues, make me want to holler and throw up both my hands. <laughs> I thought, so I, but I kept a stoic look and I said, well guys, you know, you probably need to get a, you know, find out who put that on there. Well, Dr. Dunning, I hear that you're promoting the change of our school colors. Let me show you what's on the phone. I said, guys, do you think I spend time in the office 
thinking about school colors and changing the band uniforms and worrying about the, the Passionettes dance group. You think I spent time? Well, Dr. Gunn, that's what they're saying. <laughs> so I'm sitting here at that point. My head is just it's about to hurt. But the point I'm making is social media platforms and how do you use the way they live, young people, where all I had was a newspaper and a book and a magazine. They have a device that opens them to the world. Mm -hmm. For good or ill, mm -hmm. for good or the social media platforms, it has allowed us to be meaner, faster, and quicker. We can, it's an accelerant. Mm -hmm. And so people put anything on there. And yet we are charged with guiding and leading and developing. For me, that would suggest engaging and providing a framework for dialogue. Mm -hmm. To be able to talk about this, not get frustrated with them and point and say, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. Because I was a strong-willed 19 and 20-year-old. And, and luckily we had a lot of men in my high school and they could calm us, the boys down, talk to us. So they talked about a lot of things. And we had a hierarchical structure where there was a great deal of respect for teachers and a great deal of respect for male teachers and female teachers. So they could get our attention. But we had those same sort of feelings that you see now, but it could be guided in different ways. What has happened with social media is made experts of the young. We were not experts as young people at the time. Now, if you have one of these 10 years old, 15 years old, no, that's not correct. I, I, a 12 year old can tell you that. That's not true. I, I read, so we have no filter between information and the person and the consumer. And for me, a lot of my information is filtered through an adult in school or in home or in the community. That was a filter and that information had been processed. There's no filter between a device and a person now. And so I, as a university president, I was involved with a lot of groups with students. And we used to invite them to our home for dinners. We invited homeless college students as well as foster kids. And it was just truly, my wife would facilitate these discussions. And it was truly staggering what many young people are up against who are homeless or either coming out of foster care. Mm -hmm. And so I would sit there and think about Sweetwater, Alabama, where there was not a single household, there was not a man and a woman in the house, and we didn't call defects. Foster care, if somebody got without a parent, somebody took the man, mm -hmm. took the child, but not calling the state because the state does all sorts of things to black folks at that time. So if you're going to solve this sort of what this intergenerational this divide, it's going to require some discussion. And and that's what I was trying to do at Albany by having these students in our home and me going to the residence hall. And give you I'll stop Steve because I know we have a schedule of, but I was used to walk across campus and I see the, some of the male students and I thought this issue of respect that I would hear, a lack of respect sometimes for each other and on campus. I was walking with three guys walking to me. Hey, Dr. Dunn, what's up, man? So I looked behind me. He said, Dr. Dunn, I said, what do you, I said, do I look like a what's up man? <laughs> oh, Dr. Dunn, I didn't mean any harm. I didn't mean any harm. And what I was, in a, in a humorous way, mm -hmm. saying, let's have some way we process encounters. Mm -hmm. That's not a good one. Not me, but just, just if you wouldn't, you don't want to call the university president or the department chair or the dean as if you're talking to your friends. Learn two languages, learn how to navigate. Mm -hmm. Once in, you can talk in the residence hall, you guys can say anything you want to say, but when you encounter professors and people in the classroom, then I, I explained it to them. Once they start laughing, because two of them knew exactly what I was doing. I look back, I said, I know he's not talking to me. 
And, and so I would try to figure out ways to engage and to discuss with this generational divide without, you know, way, you know, finger pointing and anger and all that, because they're not the same 19 and 20 year old as somebody in the 60s and 70s and 50s. We, we are different in how we deal with that. Steve, I'm going to leave it to you to make sure you stay on some sort of schedule. <clears throat>